call to order uh, this hearing of the Minnesota Senate Taxes Committee, Wednesday, March 6, uh, 2024, 8.40 a.m. The first item on the agenda is the adoption of minutes from uh, uh, March 5th. <clears throat> Are there corrections to the minutes? Seeing none, the minutes stand approved as presented. The first item on the um, agenda for a hearing is Senate File 4247, Senator Housechild. Senator Housechild. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the Tax Committee. Uh, today I have for your consideration Senate File 4247, which is a bill related to local government aid and county program aid. Last year we made a historic uh, investment back in our local communities and counties through an increase in the local government aid and county program aid uh, appropriation. Um, that was celebrated, I think, all across Minnesota in helping our local communities pay for many of the core services that we put upon them as our local government leaders to provide for our communities. Um, however, one of the things that many of us were hoping to do was tie that increase in aid to local government aid and county program aid to inflation. Uh, we do this for other types of aids like education, like some of our health care reimbursements, and even our own budget here at the state level. Um, and so looking at this from the aids that we do to our local governments, I think is the right thing to do. It's telling our local governments that we are committed to helping support them with the core services that they provide, and we're not going to let inflation or years go by, political gridlock, disagreements get in the way of ensuring that our local governments get the aid that lets them do the things that they need to do. This is particularly important for greater Minnesota and many of the rural and small towns that I represent. Uh, we don't have the same property tax base that many of the larger communities have. Um, we're more isolated. We don't have the same sales tax opportunities that maybe a Bloomington or somebody else might have. Um, and so ensuring that we have local government aid and county aid to many of our rural communities is of particular importance to me personally. With that said, of course, we know on the tax committee that that formula does go to many urban and suburban communities as well. So with that, Madam Chair and members, I have a couple of testifiers um, regarding this bill. Thank you. Uh, the first testifier is on Zoom, uh, Mr. Jason Solomon. Thank you, Chair Rest. Uh, my name is Jason Schoblum. I represent uh, Kuching County District Sorry, 4. I, sorry I mispronounced your name. <laughs> oh, that, that's absolutely fine. I, <laughs> I, I almost come to expect it sometimes, but uh, Welcome again, to the I, committee. I, I th th thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you, committee members, for allowing me to testify this morning uh, on behalf of uh, 4247. Um, I just give you a little brief rundown here in Kuching County. You know, uh, as Senator Hochschild had mentioned, we do not have the tax base, uh, to, you know, to do some of these uh, funding needs that we have here. Uh, some, of the, some of the funding that we have, I'll, I'll run through here quickly, is uh, we we have a, uh, a, a jail building here that we're, we're trying to build here. We're trying to plan out financially how, on how to do this here. Uh, recently, in the last couple of years, we've had a comp and class study. Um, which was not mandated, but you know, getting close to, to that point where we're, we're tipping, we were, we were kind of on the low end of, of that, and we did some some comparables, and you know, and, and with that, we got us got ourselves into a a comp and class uh, setting uh, where it's more fair and, and we're more uh, I, I would say we're more competitive in, in that market. Uh, losing, uh, uh, we are at the end of the road, so it's it's kind of difficult to attract attract people here to to want to want to work for the county. Uh, one of the other things we did here too, as I'll mention, is the public safety side of things. Uh, we had hired uh, four deputies here just this year in 2024. Uh, without some of these increases that we've seen uh, through CPA and other other areas, 
issues uh, that, the, that your committee in particular has worked on, uh, we, w we wouldn't be able to afford to do these types of things. So uh, we we're getting kind of thin on the, on, the, on the sheriff deputy side. The model that we had was, was really sometimes there was one deputy on for our whole county, and we had the second largest geographical county in the state. So we're going to be able to have a couple of deputies on 24-7, 365, uh, starting actually started earlier this year, uh, uh, thanks to some some of these increases in funding. Uh, one of the other thing that we we're able to do here too is is uh, give some increases to our hire department. Um, our hire department kind of was on on the back burner for many many years, uh, due to to whatever reasons, and they survived. But however, when they need funding, that that funding quite literally comes right out of the, out of, out of the county general fund, um, and that that's not actually the correct way to do that. I guess in, in how we were looking at it. So we did a significant increase uh, to. The highway departments, uh, specifically for equipment, equipment purchase, you know, equipment purchases, and being able to get uh, newer equipment out of the road. Some of the equipment we've had, uh, honestly, we can't get parts for, and, and it's very difficult to uh, to be able to do that. So, some of the, those are some of the some of the things that we've done with some of the increases. I also like to mention too, in 2023, uh, the increases uh, with the CPA and and the and the PILT that, that I know this committee had worked on as well were instrumental, and I can't, I, I can't express that enough, instrumental uh, to our county's uh, financial uh, responsibility to its citizens. Uh, there, you know, some, of these things, some of these things that we're trying to do with our jail requires bonds. Uh, so we've kind of planned ahead a little bit here, and we've had some increases in our, in our local levy and our property tax, our property tax levy, excuse me, uh, but we will be able to soften that blow here in the, in the next, uh, in the coming years with some of these increases that we've seen uh, uh, via through CPA, and, uh, you know, we do appreciate that. Um, also, uh, I'd like to accept an appreciation, Senator Hoshfeld, for introducing uh, this this SF four two four seven. I think I think too, it's going to help us moving forward uh, when we're trying to plan for some of these increases uh, in insurance. Our insurance, for instance, went up seventeen percent. Uh, you know, we the increases are modest. Uh, to our to our employees, you know, we're we're in the two to three percent range, and and trying to keep things things fair. And inflation is skyrocketing now. It seems like it's leveling out a little bit. However, you know, these, these this really help us uh, for future planning uh, moving forward and into the future for Coochin County. So again, uh, thank you for this opportunity, and and uh, appreciate appreciate all your work. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, our next testifier, uh, unless there are questions or comments. Next testifier is uh, Annie um, Harala. Welcome to the committee. If you'd identify yourself for the record. Great. Thank you, Chair Rest. Good morning. My name is Commissioner Annie Harala. I am a St. Louis County Commissioner. I'm elected uh, by residents in Duluth, but serve Duluth all the way to the Canadian border with our county. Um, actually, our largest, our largest county. So proud to be alongside um, Kuchichin County, your two largest geographic counties um, that are that are representing today. I want to just start by sharing my deep gratitude for all that you did this last year and in ensuring bipartisan support for legislative support to, for direct property tax relief. Every day as a county commissioner, we hear and you're hearing as other elected officials the compounding pressure of property tax and this was a direct relief to our taxpayers and I wanna tell you a little bit more about that. So when I am at um, Association of Minnesota County Conferences or I'm with other county commissioners, um, there's not often things that we all agree on. And when 87 counties come together and talk about county program aid as something that's a direct investment to help um, our constituents, it's, it's really important. So I realize that my colleague from Kuchichin County and I um, are two, but we are part of a chorus of elected officials across the state in gratitude um, through AMC and through MICA, really working and, and talking with appreciation from this. Um, C the investment in CPA was significant for St. Louis County and across the board. In fact, for us, we it was able to be 3% of our budget this last year. And what that looks like is that we didn't have to make decisions on roads or shelter for people. And when we have to get to that point of uh, having to choose between really important services, um, it's helpful for us to be able to do this um, to set our budget in a way that is both mindful of the people that we are needing to utilize property tax from, but is also a way that we're able to provide our core services as an arm of the state legislature. Often from what you set, we um, are the ones that are in charge of making sure that it happens at a local level. 
Had we not received this, we would have made some significant um, impacts into, our, into those service delivery areas. And so I think it's important for you to know that as we look at the inflationary pressures that have come, this helped us to both address inflationary pressures and also make investments, um, strategic investments in how we are serving our communities. And you know, we often talk about partnership from the state and the local level. Um, and over the years, there's been a little bump here, a little bump there, but what we're really proud of is that with this historic investment, we are back to that 2002 level. So if you were to look at, uh, if we were to continue to have those inflationary um, pressures over the years, we would be a lot more. We're appreciative to be back there, but for this to continue to be tied to inflation is so incredibly important because we are, as we all experience it together, we wanna make sure that all of the wonderful policies that you've passed at the legislature, we are able to carry out, whether it's ensuring that kids are safe, making uh, in their homes with their families, or it's ensuring that our EMS is able to uh, utilize, uh, to get to home safely on, on solid roads, or if it's ensuring wastewater treatment um, sites are all set. These uh, unique pieces um, help to invest in our community. <clears throat> I don't wanna pretend that local, uh, local governments um, can do it all, but what we do is try to do the best with everything that we can. And so we really appreciate you taking the time to invest um, in counties and invest in our local governments. And I just wanna really appreciate Senator Hostchild for continuing to be a partner with us, but also Senator Rest for your leadership. It's really important and this work is really, is wonderful. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, um, Commissioner. Next is uh, Bradley Peterson. Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities. Uh, Mr. Peterson, welcome to the committee. If you'd identify yourself for the record. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, my name is Bradley Peterson. I'm with the firm of Flaherty and Hood here today on behalf of the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities. Uh, and like every day, it is a great day to talk about uh, local government aid. Uh, before talking about uh, Senate File 4247 in particular, I want to thank the legislature and this committee in particular for all the work that was done last year. Uh, to not only increase the appropriation to its highest level in history, but also the work that was done uh, to update the formula so that it is more responsive to city needs and circumstances. Capitalizing on the work done last year is one of the key reasons the bill today brought forward by Senator Housechild is so important and has the strong support of the CGMC. Despite the LGA appropriation being at its historic high watermark, residents and businesses are nonetheless feeling the impact of disinvestment during the first decade of this millennium. Had LGA kept up with inflation since 2002, the current appropriation would be almost a billion dollars versus the $644 million that it is today. In that same time period, uh, city tax levies has, have obviously uh, risen significantly to make up for that disinvestment in the first part of the 2000s. Uh, in fact, by over 100%. Um, as was noted with uh, county program aid, uh, LJ itself only recently got back to the 2002 level um, from that time period. So there's been a lot of catch up that has needed to be done. Additionally, the best way to capitalize on the LGA formula updates uh, made last year is to continue to increase the LGA appropriation over time. This is because the way the formula works, those cities that are farthest away from what the formula says they need are the ones that benefit the most when new money is put on the formula. And so if you are going to have a dynamic, living, working formula and really capitalize on the work done last year, Timely and regular increases in the LGA appropriation are required. And so with that, really want to thank again uh, this committee and you, Senator Rest, and of course, uh, Senator Housechild for bringing this important piece of legislation forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Peterson. I have a, a couple of questions um, for you. Um, we usually, and you've been, um, you have some history here, we usually, have seen uh, a request to um, uh, re-examine the general formula for, for LGA following a, a census. So it usually occurs, you know, 10 years or so after, um, after the, the census because population is a huge factor in, in, um, 
in calculating those um, those local government aid programs. Uh, we didn't do it in 2022. We didn't have a tax bill in 2022, so we did it in 2023. But um, do you uh, do you think that we should actually um, uh, revisit it more often using estimated population updates? Uh, you know, potentially. I mean, population is just one of the inputs into the 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 formula. Um, you know, there are other factors. Um, you know that get updated. Um, you know, along as we go. I mean, it it would be one thing. You know, potentially to to look at that. Um, you know, I think one of the issues that we've historically had uh, with the formula, although it has been better since the changes made in 2013, is um, a lot of instability and unpredictability from one year to the next, and that's really actually been smoothed out pretty well uh, with the changes that were made uh, in 2013 and then continued here uh, with the changes that were made last year. Um, you know, certainly there, there's always levers to look at um, that might give us an even more predictive formula in terms of, of uh, tying it to needs, and certainly population changes and, and estimates are, are sort of one of those inputs. Um, thank you. Appreciate that comment. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, any questions or comments for Mr. Peterson? Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Nathan Jessen, Mr. Jessen. And perhaps in, in anticipation, and if you would respond to that same question, I'd be very interested. Sure thing. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Nathan Jessen, and I represent the League of Minnesota Cities. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on Senate File 4247. Also included in your packets is a letter that was provided with the Association of Minnesota Counties and LMC on this issue. And first, I'd like to thank Chair Rest and uh, this entire committee for the work that was done on local government aid last session. That increase in the formula changes represented the most significant investment in local government aid in 10 years and showed that this committee takes the state and local government partnership very seriously. This bill would take the local government aid appropriation and index it to inflation. It would represent a significant step forward in better budgeting because the reality is that inflation has been one of the most significant drivers in increased costs that cities have been facing, whether that's the cost of construction, wages, or benefits. Those costs increase every year, whereas local government aid does not. This bill would address, address that issue moving forward rather than relying on higher property tax increases or uh, significant surpluses. Um, on the question of revisiting the LGA formula, I think that that's something that, you know, as mentioned, has been done about on average every 10 years. Um, I do think that it's something that, you know, I've, I've heard from city officials that, you know, perhaps this is something we should revisit more often. As Mr. Peterson noted, there's a number of inputs. The changes to the formula last session were not as significant as the 2013 changes, which really, as Mr. Peterson noted, made it easier to budget for cities moving forward by making the appropriation much more predictable and stable. Um, but I do think it's something that, I, you know, not uh, something that we're proposing, but I do think if the committee wants to revisit the formula more often than every, every 10 years, that's something we're certainly willing to uh, help and support with. Happy to stand for any questions. Um, any questions or comments for Mr. Uh, Jessen? Um, Senator Klein. Uh, Chair, I actually just have a comment to the bill if this is the appropriate time for that. Yeah, uh, if you just wait. I will. Okay. Um, any questions for Mr. Jessen? Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. um, before I uh, call on Senator Klein, um, <clears throat> Uh, Senator Halstrow, I wonder if you would uh, take a look at Section 3 of your bill and um, um, and maybe, um, well, I would like to know um, uh, why you chose the rate of infl inflation of the implicit, implicit price deflator um, uh, for government expenditures. Um, uh, and did you consider other um, um, other price indices? And um, um, is this a typical one used for um, for a government? And then I noted in um, in some six one and two 
um, you had a, uh, you had a, a level, and then and then you had uh, uh, a base amount, and um, um, I don't recall what the definition for the implicit. That's hard for me to say. I don't know why implicit price deflator is, but if you don't mind, I'd call on um, council just to um, maybe give us a brief explanation of what the, the different kinds of price indexes, indices there are. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. That would be great. Uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. So, you know, I don't know how much detail I can get into in that myself, but um, my understanding is that this measure that's being used is more closely tied to government costs, and it's also the same measure that was used when LGA was previously adjusted for inflation, um, up until from '96 to 2003. Okay, so this is a, this is the common one that is used for um, for um, uh, for government. It's familiar one. I just it has a long name. I just want to make sure that people understand that. Um, but then why, um, in one and two, why did you make those choices? 1.025 or um, one plus the total rate of change calculated under the implicit price deflator, um, but not to exceed 1.05. Um, why did you make those choices? Thank you, Madam Chair and members. It's my understanding that that was also the way that the program was structured when there was inflation tied to the formula in the past. Okay, so this is. So it's a, I think it's we're re bringing that up. To yeah. reassert that this is a, this is what has been done um, right. before. It's not a new formula no. uh, to approach uh, this issue of inflation right. for um, for local government aid. Um, then. Uh, you did provide a, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll Oh, you're up. Yeah. Oops. I ate the mic here. Uh, you did um, provide a, a chart um, of uh, what would be the result under your bill for uh, this annual inflation and population adjustment. And I wonder if you would comment um, on the cost as, uh, as you propose that it begin with uh, calendar year 2025. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair and members. The cost in the 2425 uh, would be six million. Um, and then in the out years, 26, 27, it would be 100 and, uh, nearly 117 million. And where is that on this chart? <coughs> where is that number? Madam Chair, I, I do not know if those explicit numbers in the aggregate are listed on this, uh, on this list. However, that is the, that's the total when you add it all up from my understanding. Okay, I'm going to call on council again. That would be great. Just yeah. point out, yeah. uh, we don't have um, we don't have line numbers. We have city numbers, and I right. would encourage members to take a look at um, be, since we all know our own cities best to take a look at how this would affect our own cities. But what is the uh, where is the number, and uh, did we have it? And I just didn't see it. Madam Chair and members, yes. So on the first page of the um, data, you have the state total yes. in the top line. Um, and then in, from the revenue estimate. Um, oh, I see. So Yeah, it's so it, LGA, the appropriation increased by $32.2 million in calendar year 2025 and $49.3 million in calendar year 2026. And CPA would increase by $17.1 million in calendar year 2025 and 26.1 in calendar okay. year 2020. Thank you. So in the first in the first line, we go all the way over to the right yeah. in the first item there, and that shows a percent change of 5%. Yes. Okay. Just yes. we want to make sure mm -hmm. we see all that. Mm -hmm. And then um, for the um, counties, if you'd look at that chart. Sure. Um, if, 
you could give us um, uh, that number, and that looks like that's going to be 5.01 percent. Yeah, that's course. probably just a rounding, but it's five. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah. So it's it's very similar in uh, uh, from both, and that that increase is 17 million. Am I reading that? Am I correct? Adam Terry, yes. Okay, so to, total. To starting in 2025 for both programs added is um, uh, something um, close to $50 million. Just want to make sure we understand that, and then that would be, um, and that would be, then the base for um, computing um, uh, an inflationary increase. In the next year, Adam Chair, that's correct. Yeah. So it's the inflation added, then is the base, and then, and then from there. So, if um, <clears throat> inflation is negative, what happens, Senator Hausschild? Madam Chair, thank you for the question. The the floor, as you kind of described earlier in your question, between twenty five percent and, or excuse me. 2.5% and, and 5 So there is a floor on the inflation. Okay, so adjustment. there would be, if inflation, according to the, the uh, implicit price deflator, was zero, um, there would be no increase, correct? I, it would be no, the same as the year before. I, um, Madam Chair, from my understanding, it would be a 2.5% increase as a floor, even if inflation was below. Even but, if it was zero. That so is, how is this an inflation-adjusted increase if inflation is zero uh, from the year before and you're still asking for an increase? The, uh, that's wanna, a great... I mean, I really don't understand that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Maybe Council could... Council? ...provide any feedback, but... Madam Chair, um, I guess what I would add to that there is that floor of 2.5%. And um, there's the two components of the calculation as well of the inflation adjustment. It's the that inflation according to the implicit price deflator for government expenditures and gross investment for state and local governments. And that's the same, um, the same factor that was used previously when LGA was adjusted for inflation. And then there's also the adjustment according to the change in city population. And so those two are added together. And so, mm. you know, and if so, if inflation is zero, you would still also take into account this change in city population. And nice. then, you know, you add those two together, and then it's either going to meet that floor or not, but it's the one, 1 1.02 for um, five or the 1.5, you know, somewhere between there. Senator House Child. Um, <coughs> I note that on, um, or I'm looking to see the estimated change in population um, that would affect that number um, if we're not doing an estimated population change, which may be negative. So that would come out at zero as well. I mean, we don't want to take away any uh, uh, any appropriation, but I think um, an automatic one is very different from an inflation in just adjusted one, and that maybe we should uh, take a stronger look um, at that and and not just make it half, just an automatic half of what for 2025, the inflation adjustment would be. Mm -hmm. So I hope you will um, um, think about that. <clears throat> I certainly Klein. will, Madam Chair. It's a good suggestion. Senator Klein. Uh, thank you, Chair and Senator Halshaw. Just want to thank you for bringing Senate File 4247 and taking over the torch this year of carrying local government aid, county program aid. I can tell you from personal experience that when you return to your district after a session, you will be warmly appreciated. Uh, thanks also to the League of Minnesota Cities and the counties to, for working on the bill. Um, when we bring these bills forward, you know, we get testimony from city administrators and, and co commissioners and so forth about how it helps their budgets, and that's great and important. Um, 
One thing we don't hear about but really is out there are individual Minnesotans living in their homes with high property taxes and and they are really feeling the squeeze and this is one of our biggest and strongest tools to relieve that squeeze on Minnesotans. And I'm grateful for it because it demonstrates the, the intent of this committee to address that concern. Uh, property taxes are indifferent to a person's income that year uh, and in many cases are contributing to our housing crisis in this state. So. Thank you for the bill. I'm in the process right now of emailing your staff to see if I can add my name. Um, Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Being a former local government official, I've always been supportive of LGA and CPA, and, but I'd like to make a couple comments here regarding this automatic uh, inflation, inflation adjustment. I think the one thing that local units of government need to be aware of is that along with funding, providing some funding for local government, state government has a great propensity to provide uh, many mandates that uh, they do. And, and with an automatic increase, quite frankly, there will be even less of a check on state government to produce mandates that you need to follow. Um, quite frankly, that was evidenced last year by the historic defunding of E12 education uh, with the Great talk has been made about the increased money being given education, but when you stop and take away the cost of the mandates, most of the school districts, particularly in my area, are winding up on the short side of that particular stick. And so I remember coming up to the legislature as a council member and a mayor and arguing for and defending uh, LGA. Uh, and. Um, and quite frankly, but one of the things that we did, instead of arguing for maintaining of the funding or increasing the funding, was there was an equal argument against the mandates that were imposed by state government. And I'm going to make a statement publicly that I have told each of you privately. And that is, I would like, you have really honed your skills as far as asking for more money. But I really haven't, don't think you've honed your skills in arguing against the mandates. And uh, if you didn't have a lot of the mandates, quite frankly, you wouldn't need the extra money and, and many times. And so I would like you to go back and deal with that issue within your respective organizations uh, because um, those of us who argue against mandates up here uh, would like some stronger support from those who those mandates negatively affect. And that, Madam Chair, is the extent of my comments today. Uh, th thank you, um, Senator uh, Weber. I find that very interesting because one of the things about mandates on local governments that um, really seldom gets the light of day is what the costs are. And I uh, just yesterday met with representatives of the cities and um, um, <clears throat> and. Uh, um, and counties um, about um, <clears throat> the um, effectiveness of uh, local impact notes that the LBO prepares um, to guide legislators when they do have bills that um, uh, insist on or that provide for um, a, um, a local government impact and it's not um, this is just cities and, and counties, not, not school districts, which is, you know, a, a whole new universe, actually. Um, but cities and, and counties are ones that we, can, we address here. And how that process can be made um, more, <clears throat> I hate to use the word transparent, but certainly more meaningful to, uh, to legislators and uh, actually give uh, local governments um, information that they can use saying this, this indeed is what it's going to uh, cost us and they can come forward on that. And I received, um, uh, well for me it was overnight, but um, a, um, a, a very interesting memo which I will share with members of the committee of suggestions from um, those who were um, present, it was written by Mr. Hilgart, um, 
uh, about how that how that process could be improved. And I have a meeting scheduled with um, Senator Pratt um, because he's been one to ask for a local impact note, and my, myself and um, um, uh, the head of the S Senate Fiscal, and with with um, Mr. Larson and Joel Enders from LBO. Um, just looking, I mean, your bill kind of brings that up, quite frankly, um, <clears throat> brings those issues up. Just what we can, um, um, how we can get <clears throat> better information, quicker information, something that doesn't take months to um, devise, at least as a beginning point of examining the local impact of, of, um, of uh, state man mandates. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure how easy that's going to be, <laughs> but, um, but I do believe it's necessary. So we are going to be um, looking at that. Um, <clears throat> so thank you, thank you very much for kind of uh, um, bringing that up um, th through um, more than one of your bills. More than one of your bills is bringing that, those issues up. And I, uh, I thank you for that. Um, and, and you, Senator Weber, thank you. Um, Senator Dreskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, members, I continue to struggle with, uh, with this notion that uh, if, uh, if we take $2 out of the taxpayer's pocket and we put $1 back in, that we're somehow um, giving tax relief. And um, I think the numbers, as we look at where we've gone just in, in the last couple of years, um, $80 million increase in local government aid in the last uh, tax bill that went through this body and was signed into law. In the meantime, Senator Hochschild, uh, local governments have increased property taxes on average by 6.8%. We're not seeing property tax relief. We're seeing spending increases. And you know, it's it's a nice gesture to local units of government, and um, and we all have local units of government in our districts, and they need to do the work that they have. I think Senator Weber did a good job talking about mandates. Um, you know, I didn't I didn't really ask the local government officials the question, but uh, I I don't think any of them probably support the paid medical family leave mandate that's placed upon them. It's going to hit in January of 2026, um, about the time that uh, your bill here would would um, would uh, work into the system. But we are now facing uh, with the people's money a state budget structural deficit that's projected in 26 and 27 and your bill takes effect at exactly that same time. So should we spend another $100 million and make the hole deeper in 26 and 27? That's what this bill does. And I don't think that's good fiscal policy to take something that's projected to be a deficit and make the deficit worse. Um, we still don't see the property tax relief uh, coming. Cities are increasing in, in 2024, their levies by 7.5%. Of course, that's nothing compared to the 40% that the state government did in the last biennium with their spending, or the 20% per year if you, if you look at it that way. But those are huge numbers historically compared to where local governments used to spend. And it just seems that more and more that we put into it at 50% property tax relief, according to the, the smart people, Madam Chair, uh, that uh, give us these numbers through their, their models, um, that that's not a very good deal for the taxpayers. And it doesn't provide the incentives for local units of government to reduce spending. They only continue to increase. And, um, now we're going to put that's th this spending on autopilot in this bill and and spend us on autopilot 
uh, into a position where we exacerbate a projected structural deficit. I don't think it's a good idea. Um, but of course, uh, local government officials like it because it gives them more money to spend, uh, which they can either grow local government more or uh, pay for commitments already put forward uh, without having to go and take the money from property taxpayers themselves. Because that's not a very good position to be in to tell ta property taxpayers we're going to increase your taxes. But let's take it from that, that nebulous state government over there that's just, you know, they've just got all kinds of money uh, that just kind of accumulates and grows on trees in St. Paul. The reality is that's the people's money too, and uh, this is not an efficient uh, delivery model. So, uh, Madam Chair, um, not really a question, but more no, more more comments. And uh, I don't think the time is right for this. I, I don't think it's um, it's well thought out and it's timing. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Driscowski. A question for, if you don't mind, Senator House Chow. A question for um, Council again, and maybe this is a. <clears throat> um, um, this is Ms. Johnson or, or Mr. Sylvia, or actually uh, um, one of the two sitting back there. But how many um, um, calculations are done in our tax systems that um, <clears throat> uh, have an inflation adjustment, an annual inflation adjustment? Um, are there any in the property tax um, system? I know there are some in the income tax system that Ms. Pollock could speak to, but are there any in the, um, in the property tax system? And then secondly, um, <clears throat> in the statutes, um, how is local government aid and county program aid, how are they defined? Uh, Mr. Sylvia, uh, Ms. Johnson, are there any that are in any inflation adjustments or Mr. Mon, how are there uh, other places where an inflation adjustment becomes kind of an, uh, as uh, Senator Draskowski is pointing out, kind of an, auto, an autopilot with regard to additional resources? Mr. Munn? Um, Madam Chair, there are a number of things in the tax statutes that are subject to inflation. Um, I would have to look to get a comprehensive list, but just off the top of my head, I can think of like, the, the income tax brackets are adjusted annually for inflation. Um, and, and similarly, I would uh, have to look at the entire list to differentiate between property tax um, and okay. other types of taxes. And of course, the, the budget forecast is now adjusted for inflation in terms of um, the a directive document, um, which we used to get that information, but not, not as part of the official um, uh, numbers in the in the forecast, and we understand that it is adjusted for um, inflation. Is that is that an accurate statement, um, Madam Chair? The uh, budget forecast, uh, beginning in February of last year, um, began to include a line that um, estimated inflation, um, but it, it was not. Um, it's basically just a single line in the fund balance that uh, contains um, the expected uh, inflation of all, uh, you know, most state appropriations. And it ends up, as I understand it, not particularly being a directive because you can, you can still spend um, uh, whatever or appropriate whatever seems of. Um, <laughs> Uh, necessary uh, regardless of, of that line. In the end, it really doesn't make the difference. It's just additional information. M Madam Chair, that, that's correct. It's, it's the inflation f uh, number in the um, forecast is not an appropriated amount. Um, right. and, and you're correct. If, if uh, appropriations uh, do not increase, that 
inflation line does not get spent or appropriated anywhere. What about the definition of uh, local government aid? Madam Chair, members, Ms. Johnson. Um, local government aid, it's a general purpose aid that can be used for any lawful expenditure. And so, and the reason why I think that's important, Senator Housechild and, and Senator Droskowski, is that um, although we talk about it at the legislature as being um, specifically directed toward property tax relief, it is not necessarily and it is not statutorily required. Um, that might be what we want it to be used for, but that's not the statutory definition. It is a general purpose aid, and I'm assuming that county program aid has a similar um, definition. Is that correct? Yeah. So we want to keep that uh, keep that in mind. I I believe as we um, as we look at <coughs> um, other programs and other bills that are asking for uh, aids. But keeping in mind that LGA and CPA are general purpose aids for any number of um, <clears throat> uh, uh, expenses that uh, counties and other local governments are, um, uh, are faced with. Any other uh, questions or comments for um, Senator Putnam, for Senator Housechild? Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a much less technical uh, question. Uh, more for context than anything, because we have been discussing uh, the m mandates of the programs that were created by this legislature last session. Senator Housad, I know that you're deeply committed to your local communities and you're in touch with all your local officials. Can you uh, maybe uh, answer this question? Do you think that your communities were just swimming in cash in 2022? <laughs> Senator Housechild? Madam Chair and Senator Putnam, no, uh, they were not. Um, and many of the communities, and we're gonna touch on some other bills here that, that I have before you that get right to that point, right? When we're facing an EMS crisis uh, in greater Minnesota, when we're facing a mental health crisis uh, in the entire state, there are a lot of challenges that our local governments are taking on um, and providing this state support, I think helps them do those core services that we put on them, right? And so that's the, that's the benefit of these programs. Okay, if there are no further um, um, comments or, or questions about this bill, Senate uh, File 4247 is laid over. The next bill on our agenda is Senate File 3757, um, um, which is um, uh, <clears throat> also an aid increase, and this time uh, relating to uh, town aid, township aid. Senator um, Housechild. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the Tax Committee. That was a robust conversation about local government aid and county program aid. Um, now we're gonna go one step further. Um, last session, we made those historic investments in LGA and CPA. However, many of our most rural communities are townships. And I know many of the members of this committee represent a lot of townships. Um, we do have a township aid program similar to LGA and CPA, um, but that program has not been increased since 2014. Um, and so no increase has gone to our townships. Um, you know, so while I'm excited that we provided a lot of funding for our cities and our counties, um, we know that even further down, our townships are even more isolated. They're even lower property tax base than many of our small towns. And the opportunity to get them some state aid that matches the proportional increase that we had in local government aid and, and county program aid is really what the goal of this bill is. Um, and so I did bring with me two testifiers, Madam Chair, um, who can talk about um, the, the challenges facing townships and just the need for equitable increase and support for that aid program for our townships. Um, th thank and happy you to talk more the, about the bill uh, as well. Explanation, um, if you would just uh, look at the sections of the bill very, yes. very quickly. Um, and um, uh, which is most in your in in the section one and just describe um, how uh, the eligibility for this aid is going to come about and so forth appreciate it and that's on lines um, well it defines the the town aid factor 
um, in line 2.2 and 2.3, and then um, and then the explanation 2.8, if you'd look at that and just give us a little bit more information. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the, the township aid factor is really based on three components, um, agriculture property, um, the town area factor and the population factor. Um, and so that's really the aid formula that, that has existed for this program in the past. It's actually, I will admit, an area that I'd like to look further into. I've actually been working with council on sort of exploring that formula and making sure that sort of townships outside of just agriculture areas are, are uh, considered a part of this township aid maybe a little bit strong, more strongly. I will also say there are three counties, and I know of one of them because I represent one of them, Kuchichin County, which does not have any incorporated townships, and the county provides those services for those townships. And so, for example, this aid uh, program would not actually go to any townships in Kuchichin County. That's just one example. Um, are, you, are you aware of how, um, how common that might be in other counties? Um, Madam Does Chair, council know uh, how many how many counties have no incorporated or very few incorporated uh, townships? And uh, Senator House Child, do you know that number? I do. Yeah, it's three counties. It's Kuchichin County, Lake of the Woods County, and I. I forgive me. I'm forgetting what the other uh, one is. I'm sure I could find it here. If you give me a minute, um, maybe I don't have it in front of me, Madam Chair. But I, yeah. If maybe council has an idea or of what maybe, the third is. Maybe one of your witnesses or maybe a representative yeah. from AMC would be able to tell us that. Um, and then the, um, so you use those three factors in, in order to come to the eight amount um, in 2.8 and, and through 2.11. And then, um, and then you have a, um, in the second section, um, you have an automatic, or you have a stated number, I'll put it that way. Right now, the limit is $10 million, yep. and what you're doing is taking an additional $1.5 million and using the formula that is in your bill um, for its distribution. But you're not addressing the townships that are not incorporated. Is that correct? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, that is correct, that the townships that are not incorporated, for example, in Kuchichin County, would not currently, under this bill, be covered. I, I do just want to add one more piece, if that's OK. Um, while you're correct that we increased the aid in this bill from $10 million to 11.5, the other thing that we did in this bill is previously this aid amount was cut off um, when the aid reached the, the full formula, and we've changed a factor in the formula to make sure that the full amount is then equitably distributed back to those townships if there's a small remainder left. <clears throat> so we were leaving about, a I believe it was about a million dollars on the table um, because the formula was full, and now we're kind of making it so that that money gets distributed uh, appropriately across the formula. Senator House Child, I'm embarrassed to tell you that the third county is Hennepin, and I should have known that. Oh, it is. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Um, any any questions for um, Senator Housechild about the bill before we go to uh, testifiers? Senator Nelson. Oh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This may be able to wait till after testifiers, but at some point I'm uh, wondering, do you have a run that would show how these funds would be distributed to townships uh, without a, a Senate file a 3757 and then what it would look like mm -hmm. with 3757? Senator House Child. Madam Chair um, and Senator Nelson, I would also like to see those runs, and I don't believe we have. Uh, Rachel uh, with Council, Ms. Yeah, Johnson. Ms. Johnson. Madam Chair, uh, Senator Nelson, so we don't have an updated run for pay 2025 because the data isn't um, available yet, but just for some context, the city that receives, or the town that receives the highest amount of funds in pay 24 received about 18,000. 
And so um, kind of a rough estimate of that upper limit of the increase would be about 4,000 for a town that's receiving on the higher end, but can go all the way down to about $12 as the lowest mm -hmm. amount that a town's receiving. So just to give you an idea. Thank you. I do hope to see the runs at some point. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Senator Hall's child. Um, any other questions before we invite the witnesses? Uh, Senator Klein. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, Senator Nelson asked the precise question which I was going to ask. So, um, so I'd like to invi invite um, uh, Mr. Burdoff um, to testify, President of the Minnesota Association of Townships. Welcome to the um, um, committee, sir. If you would identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Chair S. and uh, and the members of the committee. Uh, my name is Gary Berdorf. I'm the president of the Minnesota Association of Townships Board of Directors uh, and a township supervisor from Green Isle Township in Sibley County. Um, the Minnesota Association of Townships represents Minnesota's 1,777 townships, which have approximately 916,000 residents, which is about 17% of the state's population. <coughs> Excuse me. Minnesota Association of Townships strongly supports Senate File uh, 3757, uh, authored by Senator Hochschild. Uh, this bill is simple. It increases state aid to township and raises the cap, which is allowable to, for townships to receive. Um, I'll provide some perspective. Uh, townships are very frugal and efficient. Over the past 10 years, revenues have, gone, <clears throat> have grown only 9.8% inflation. Uh, adjusted dollars less than 1% per year. Uh, in 2022, total township revenues were 409.1 million. Um, these expenditures were 381.3 million. Most forms of direct state aid to township have been eliminated. On average, the largest source of township revenue, about 73%, is local property tax. Townships also have approximately 55,500 uh, miles of road, which is 41% of Minnesota's roads, and more than any other single level of road authority in the state. Uh, road and bridge expenditures are far away. Uh, the largest expense for, far away, uh, the largest expense for, for townships at the cost of $229 million per year. Other categories of expenses include uh, general government expenses, fire protection, uh, debt payments, water and wastewater services, and public safety. This bill adjusts <clears throat> the limits of township aid for townships. It increases the annual town aid amount from 10 million to 11.5 million. I want to personally thank Senator Hochschild for authoring this bill and to the committee for your consideration. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, next we have um, Mr. Daniel Gilbert, Township Supervisor for Harris Township. Welcome to the committee. If you'd identify yourself for the record. Good evening. Hello, uh, Madam Chair and uh, members of Tax Committee. Thank you for having me here to uh, testify on behalf of Senate File 3757, uh, uh, Town Aid Amount Increase and Town Calculation Modification Provisions. Um, I am obviously the Board Supervisor for Harris Township. Um, I'm coming from Harris Township. is located up in uh, north central Minnesota. 
Uh, we're in Itasca County. We border Grand Rapids to the south, kind of give you an idea where we're at. Uh, I'm going on my fourth year as a board supervisor. This is uh, actually my election year. I like to classify Harris Township as a bigger small town with a population around 4,000. So I know you guys hear a lot about uh, roads and bridges, how they're affected by taxes. Uh, I just want to give you a little different perspective of townships and uh, what, what we deal with. So a uh, little dis dis perspective on what townships are referred to as, uh, general provision local governments like we've heard earlier, grassroots governments or the United States Central Bureau considers as minor civil divisions. I'm here to help you see the struggles we have to make with our parks handicap accessible. Um, simple stuff as like putting shade on our dugouts for our ball players, you know, the Little League. Um, also, uh, simple pollinator gardens and to update our boat landings for safety. Uh, road projects like we try to allocate money for end up taking years to a complete with the money that we're given. Uh, because of day-to-day -day operations are affected by the revenue that we have to work with, so I applaud Senator Hoschild as in this is a good start. Um, the aid calculation has not been changed since 2014 as he mentioned. So this is a nice step in the right direction. So I made this three hour road tour um, to come down here to send up here to testify to thank Senator Hoschild for the increases to aid given to the townships to help with their operating budgets. And just to give you guys a little perspective of small town governments and what we work on. Um, we have to put the parks together as, you know, piece by piece. We're like, you know, municipalities or state governments will hire a contractor to come in. So with the smaller town governments, we kind of focus on more of the individual aspects of what we need to do for our townships. So um, I really appreciate the opportunity to come down and talk to you guys. Um, and that's all I have. I would feel some questions if anybody's got any questions about townships. Thank you very much. Are there questions or comments for <coughs> Mr. Gilbert? Um, anything further for Senator Housechild? Then Senator Housechild, Senate file um, 3757 is laid over. Um, <coughs> thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Thanks for making the me. next item is Senate file 4042. 4422, um, Senator Housechild. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, I have before you Senate File 4422, a bill regarding aid for soil and water conservation districts. Uh, last year, this committee created an aid program for soil and water conservation districts with 15 million in funding for both 23 and 24. Uh, currently, that funding level is set to drop to 12 million come 2025. But this bill would increase those funds starting in 2025 at 16 million. Like all forms of local government, it takes funding to do the work of soil and water conservation districts and providing this aid bolsters local communities and landowners as they navigate the regulations and obligations that they face. Um, without this increase, the soil and water conservation districts will not have the funds, uh, I believe, in order to do the best work that they can that we ask of them at the local level. Um, so Madam Chair, I do have a testifier um, to talk a, a little bit about this bill. Um, thank you, Senator Housechild. Uh, welcome to the committee. Pleased to have your testimony. I wonder if you would give us, uh, um, before your support for this bill, just a little bit more history of how the um, funding of the uh, soil and water conservation districts were done in the past, what changed last year, um, and a little bit more about why you're asking for um, a, uh, what is it, a $4 million? Um, a $4 million uh, uh, increase um, starting this current year and, and going, um, uh, or for AIDS payable in 2025, but then it's an ongoing, so it is, there is a $4 million tail in, in, this, um, in this appropriation. So if you would address your comments uh, to those um, questions as well as um, the testimony that you were prepared to, to give. 
Thank you and good morning, Madam Chair and members. Sheila Vanny, I'm the Assistant Director with the Minnesota Association of Soil and Water Conservation Districts. We represent the state's 440 locally elected SWCD board members and their approximately 470 uh, professional conservation staff. Uh, I wanna thank you for the time to speak to this uh, SWCD aid funding bill before you today. And of course, thank Senator Hoschild for carrying the bill. Um, last session was a pretty remarkable session as we saw the establishment of SWCD aid as an ongoing statutory appropriation. The predictability that comes with that um, can't be, uh, uh, it's a game changer for soil and water conservation districts who struggle um, with the planning aspects and um, charting out their workload, their staffing needs um, in order to achieve our, our water quality goals and our healthy soil goals. And Madam Chair, to your questions as to uh, previous state funding toward SWCDs, uh, we provided a handout to the committee members that has a graphic that, yes, yes. Yeah, thank we, you, Madam Chair. I would draw members' attention in, in their packets to this, um, this chart. It's very helpful, thank you. But if you would explain more of it. Absolutely, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so starting in fiscal year 16, um, that was uh, the 2015 legislative session, state funding for SWCDs was appropriated in $11 million per year or $22 million over the biennium out of the Clean Water Fund. Uh, the Clean Water Fund um, does zero-based budgeting um, with recommendations from the Clean Water Council. Every uh, two years, the, the, the slate is wiped clean and they come up with a new package of funding recommendations um, which have no base, no um, expectation around um, a next uh, funding allocation in the next biennium. Um, that said, um, we uh, did in the next biennium um, receive another 11 million for the fiscal years 18 and 19 um, years. And starting in fiscal year 20, so um, 2019 um, through fiscal year 23, um, we saw $12 million in clean water funds distributed to the SWCDs. And I should point out too that each one of these allocations or appropriations gets distributed to the state's 88 soil and water conservation districts in addition to Hennepin and Ramsey County who um, deliver on the duties of an SWCD. Um, so over that time, um, we, we haven't seen significant increases um, but the SWCD aid appropriation then for um, payable 23 and 24 at 15 million um, was a, a substantial um, step in the direction of providing um, more sufficient funding for SWCDs uh, in the neighborhood of about 20 to 30,000 increase to each of those um, 90 soil and water conservation entities. Um, that um, going forward, however, to um, go back to the $12 million uh, um, amount that we saw in 2019 um, would put us, um, you know, just following on the, the heels of some of the conversations related to inflation, um, that uh, would put us in a position of only being able to do approximately 80% of what we were doing in, in 2019. Um, so that significantly hampers our ability to uh, continue to make progress on our goals and uh, the key landowner relationships that are needed, um, which takes a significant amount of time and effort um, in order for them to do voluntary incentive-based conservation. I'm not sure if I entirely answered your questions, Madam Chair. No, it's, it's very, very helpful. Um, the, the 15 million that you reference in 23 and 24, um, was that carried in the 2023 uh, tax bill as well? And then the indication there, just wanna make sure we all understand where it happened because we didn't do it before 2023. So that's important. And that, so in the 2023 bill uh, for 23 and 24, 
we put in 15 million, but then going forward in the next biennium, uh, it was reduced to um, 12. I believe in the in, within the conference committee, it was sometimes at 14, um, but ultimately the the um, um, the reallocation of the funds that we had within our target dropped that down to um, to 12. So I just want to make sure everybody understands why. Um, it was not because the request was not warranted. It was because of available funds going forward and our tails. That's why it went to 12, not for any other reason. Um, any other um, questions for um, Ms. Vanny or uh, Senator Housechild with regard to either the handout or to the bill itself? Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, just with the uh, change uh, in funding uh, source, I, I'm just curious. Uh, I wasn't here when the uh, um, quarter percent sales tax clean water fund was established. And when that was uh, voted on by Minnesotans, did they, was it, did they anticipate that that would be funding things like soil and water conservation districts? I, I don't know if that's possible to answer at this point or not, but it's an important piece of history to understand. Um, Ms. Vanny or Senator Hallstrom? Madam Chair, I'll defer to the testimony. Ms. Vanny. Thank you, Madam Chair and, and Senator Nelson for the question. I think um, I, I don't want to be put in the position of um, speculating as to the intent of any given voter um, who voted um, in approval of that uh, dedicated sales tax. Um, but the way that that portion of, of the sales tax going toward the Clean Water Fund um, was set up was um, I think in, in large part to address uh, water quality impairments, protect our, the waters that are in good shape um, without specificity probably around how that got done. Um, so I, I, I don't think there was a lot of detail or expectation, um, but I, I can't speak for any of the other voters. Thank you, just some clarity there, thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Nelson. Anything further, Senator Housechild? No, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Vanny, for your testimony. And Senate File 4422 will be laid over. The next bill um, is Senate File 3886. Senator Housechild, um, please explain your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the Tax Committee. The issue of emergency medical services has been bubbling for many, many years. Um, however, it's my perspective, and I think the perspective of many stakeholders and community members and first responders, that we've really gone from a problem or a challenge to a crisis in Minnesota when it comes to our emergency response. Um, and I would argue that this is actually an underlying issue for the broader healthcare landscape that we face in Minnesota and really in our country. It's the canary in the coal mine when it comes to rural health care in particular. And so I'm acutely aware of that having, uh, being in this position representing the most rural district in Minnesota. However, uh, as we know and what we'll hear from testifiers is that this issue is really being seen statewide. And the reason it's being seen statewide is because this is really uh, something that has been, a ball that has been dropped by our federal partners. The reimbursement rate for Medicare and Medicaid for ambulance has not kept up with the costs. And this is causing a cascading effect and a burden on many of our um, smallest providers. In Minnesota, we have our emergency medical services structured in such a way that has not really been revisited since the late 70s, early 80s. In that structure, we have primary service areas, which are regions across our state that are where the licenses are held for these services. And what we see oftentimes in greater Minnesota is that these licenses are not being picked up by private hospitals. They're not being picked up by large nonprofits like perhaps some of the suburbs or larger communities. They're not picked up even by fire districts. Um, these are local 
small towns that are taking on these licenses. And the reason that they're taking on the license is because at the end of the day, they are the last resort. We constantly put additional burdens on our local governments to handle the things that finally get passed down to them in order to ha handle the biggest challenges that we face. And I think EMS is at the forefront of the biggest challenges that our small local governments are taking on. What this does is it compounds the issue because then that license that is held by these local small communities that is not receiving the proper reimbursement from the federal government is put on the local property tax owners to fund these core services that we are facing in greater Minnesota and in these rural regions. The truth is, um, to me, I think it's a moral imperative that your zip code not determine whether or not an ambulance shows up for you or a loved one when you're facing a health crisis. Um, that is a state obligation. That's a federal obligation. Certainly, I will continue pushing our federal partners. I went to DC um, before session, started to advocate with our federal partners on the federal reimbursement. But my role as a state senator is to do what I can with the, the, the power that I have and that we, that we have as, as policyholders here in the state. So what I'm looking at, Madam Chair, is a one-time emergency aid to license holders for ambulance services across the state of Minnesota. The Emergency Medical Services um, Board has determined through um, data collection in 2022 that the cost for the deficits facing our ambulance license holders is to, in the tune of $122 million. Um, and so we are facing a huge deficit for many of our providers. And as you can imagine, Madam Chair, um, it's all across the state. But again, I can't, I can't emphasize enough that it's oftentimes our, our smallest communities, our non-private providers that are taking on even more additional burdens, passing those on to local property owners. We're facing additional challenges with EMS. We're facing a workforce challenge just like any other industry, but the pay for these volunteer services and even for the career uh, uh, paramedics is not at a level that we need in order to keep them in the profession. We also have a challenge for many of our primary service areas in greater Minnesota where we have a free rider uh, situation going on. The local community might take on the license for that broader region, and then what happens is many of the townships, many of the rural and, and isolated members, the lake cabin owners, are not necessarily property owners for that local community. And, and as you can imagine, many of the additional costs for ambulance is the further distance you have to go. And so many of these folks um, are not paying into the system. So we have a lot of challenges, and this is a really, really complex issue. And I want you all to know that, and I'm sure many of you have seen, that we do have a bipartisan statewide task force that was formed late last year. We've hosted five roundtables across the state and various regions um, to talk about these challenges. Please know that there are efforts underway beyond just uh, one-time emergency aid to address this challenge. We're not here to talk about that, but I do think for the context of understanding that I'm not just asking for a Band-Aid and let's just wait for this challenge to get worse. What I'm asking for is let's put out the fire, let's help our communities get back to net neutral, and let's work in the mid to long term on some regulatory changes, on some changes to the primary service areas, on some local taxing district ideas to help us get to a sustainable future for our emergency medical services. Madam Chair, I'm happy to go through the bill really yes, quickly if you'd yes. like. Yes, that's the, um, I think we need to understand Thank you. who's in charge of it, where the aid, where the aid um, is going, the eligibility and the, and the provisions for how it's, it's um, calculated, what the responsibilities are, the recipients and so forth. So if you would go through um, the bill section by section, I think it's pretty straightforward, but um, we should have it on the public record. Th um, Senator Hell's child. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. And I will just start by saying um, we are still working on this bill, I will admit. And so I don't want you all to assume that this is perhaps the final product. Um, working with Council's Office, Ms. Johnson and some others on making sure that we have some of the things you just mentioned structured in a way that works for the Department of Revenue, for the EMSRB, and other uh, involved parties. And Senator, um, yeah, Senator Hellstra, I think I indicated to you that 
the bill will be laid over, right. but once we have additional information, yes. uh, we'll take the bill off the table and we will have a public hearing on what the amendments will be. Right. It will not go into the um, omnibus bill um, uh, without an additional hearing of how the costs are, are being developed and, and so forth and a fiscal note. So this bill, I wanted to hear it today because it's important, but uh, we will uh, we will hear it again with a um, with a fiscal note and whatever changes or amendments um, that will um, uh, cause you to consider to to offer. Um, we will we will revisit this bill. But if you would go through it now before we call on your witnesses. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate the additional context. Just wanted to make sure that was clear to the committee members. So section one, um, I'll just start with subdivision two. Obviously subdivision one is definitions, as you can see. Um, in subdivision two, this is the eligibility piece. And so it would require that an ambulance service provider have held the license in calendar year 2022 and maintained that license in 2024. Um, subdivision three is the application process that would authorize the Department of Revenue Commissioner to establish an application process for eligible licensed service providers to apply for this aid and calculate the aid payment, which I'll get to in the next uh, subdivision four. Subdivision four um, explains how we will determine whether or not a license holder has a, had, excuse me, a deficit in 2022, which is when this aid is, is um, looking to help support. So it would be a product of uh, $34 times the applicant's total volunteer hours. Why, why $34, Senator House John? From my understanding, Madam Chair, that is the average cost that is reimbursed for, um, for volunteer. Currently. Uh, Yes. Currently, okay. Yes. Um, the second is the applicant's total operating expenses, obviously, and then number three is the applicant's total capital expenses um, minus their revenue. And so that would get us to understand their deficit that they're facing, which they could then, in, sec in subdivision five, apply for that aid amount well, based on that how calculation. How much would go to a, a single ambulance service? That's exactly service. right. Exactly right. Yep. Um, subdivision six requires that the, uh, speaking of mandates, this would require recipients spend the aid on expenses incurred in provisions of the licensed ambulance service and the primary service area for which they hold the license. Subdivision seven, um, this requires the commissioner to certify the well, aid I think amount. I'm going to go back to that. Yes, please. That yep. one, I think it's important. It, um, oh, you were going to go to subdivision seven. Yes, Madam Chair. It's going, it's to go out this year, by the end of the year. This is That's not it. putting it off until 2020, uh, 2025, it, to go out before the end of this year. That's correct, Madam Chair. So the aid would go out by December 31st, 2024. Subdivision eight is a report requirement to ensure that these funds are utilized in the way that we described in the subdivisions previously mentioned. And subdivision nine is the appropriation, which includes the overarching $120 million appropriation uh, plus um, in, in authorization for the commissioner to maintain a million dollars for administrative costs or transfers to the EMSRB. Um, Senator Housechild, we might want to have a little bit more comment later um, from the department mm -hmm. about uh, what, uh, what funding is actually necessary and uh, uh, maybe a million dollars is not uh, is not the number <laughs> and there's also a blank for reimburse, reimbursing the EMSRB um, and we'll need we'll need a fiscal note and and more comment um, on that um, for um, uh, uh, for um, the second hearing. And um, also, I think it's a bit vague in the report to say it would just include a summary. I would assume that uh, they will have a pretty detailed information about um, how, um, how each ambulance service, uh, just for their own audit, you know, financials and 
and that maybe more uh, detail would be um, uh, would be a appropriate um, oversight. How many ambulance services are there that would be that you are assuming would be um, uh, eligible? So we know that. So we know just. Um, we're not talking about four things costing a million dollars. We're talking about how many? Hundred? Madam Chair, yeah, I, unfortunately I don't have that absolute number in front of me, but I can imagine that it's over a hundred. Okay. So that, that, that could be an indicator about, well, why does it cost so much to yes. administer it? So it, it is not just uh, for big ones, and I think it, I think the implication there is looking at your at this chart mm -hmm. just to start with about how many ambulance services are um, um, are involved, and I'll make the comment. And they're not just uh, in Greater Minnesota. You can see on here that North Memorial Health um, has uh, any number of uh, those services that are offered in. Um, in greater Minnesota, both uh, ambulances and also helicopter services. Mm -hmm. um, and I point out uh, with a bit of pride that one of our own senators is a helicopter pilot uh, for North Memorial, and that is Senator Lang. So yes. um, uh, the, the legislature has a personal connection with uh, mm -hmm. providing um, uh, uh, EMS services. Um, Madam so, Chair, I do have an answer to your question, if okay, that's okay. Good. It's 128. I, the gentleman behind you gave it to you. Yes. That's great. Yes. <laughs> How many are there? 128, Madam Chair. 128. And that is the EMSRB um, yes. so that, executive director. Yes, so that is a significant number that, that um, uh, we're talking about providing this emergency aid to. Um, are there other questions, or may we proceed to the witnesses? Um, Senator Housechild will ask your witnesses to come forward in the order that they are listed on the the um, uh, uh, on the agenda. You have two chairs there. Maybe they can come up in pairs, mm -hmm. and then we will begin the testimony. Um, Ms. Olmstead and Mr. Sukhanen. We have approximately, um, because we started late, we have approximately um, 25 to 30 minutes. So there are a number of people here. Please don't make us cut out someone with the length of your testimony. So please be, uh, be considerate. Um, so Ms. Olmstead, if you'd identify yourself for the record, um, we will uh, um, welcome your testimony. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Melanie Olmstead. I'm the director of the Hoyt Lakes Ambulance Service. We're a part-time advanced life support paid on call ambulance service in northeastern Minnesota. We're located approximately 60 miles north of Duluth and we cover 180 square miles in our primary service area. Uh, this includes <coughs> seven cities and townships and unorganized areas. Last year we had 972 calls of those 431 interfacility transfers out of our critical care access hospital to higher levels of care. 95% of those transfers required ALS intervention, interventions and monitoring. In 2022, we lost $85,000. Last year, we lost $67,000. Like many ambulance services in, in our area, and we've been told by our city leadership that if this continues, we are not sustainable. <clears throat> Let me give you an example. We can all agree funding the state patrol is essential. Now imagine funding the state patrol with only revenue coming from White Bear Lake taxpayers, but still be mandated to cover the entire state. This is the reality for many, if not all, EMS agencies in Northeastern Minnesota. The city of Hoyt Lakes is the only local government in the 180 square mile PSA 
financially responsible for the operational costs of the White Lakes Ambulance. Yet we remain mandated to cover the PSA without any additional funds. I urge you to pass emergency ambulance aid bill to fill the gap until sustainable revenue source can be considered in the future by legislature. I also ask if you can, that you continue your efforts to classify EMS as an essential service, continue working on assisting local governments in forming taxing districts, and to continue working with your partners at the national level to increase Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement for EMS services. For decades in rural Minnesota, EMS has been run on the backs of volunteers. Shift workers at the mines taking calls with little to no sleep only to return to work. It's time EMS is taken off the back burner and focus was placed on this true crisis. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, Dina Sukanen. All right, so I'm Dina Sukanen. I live in rural Minnesota and I'm the ambulance director for the Tower Area Ambulance Service. We have the same issues as Mel does, but I'm gonna go on a different way. I'm gonna talk about what would we do if we call 911 and nobody shows up? Um, I grew up in an EMS family. My dad started, he was the first EMT in Tower, Minnesota. So I grew up watching this. I grew up seeing people that went out and helped other people as heroes. Um, my Oldest brother drowned in Lake Vermilion in 1966. When the ambulance got there, and remember the ambulances back in these days, they didn't know how to work the equipment. So my dad lost his oldest son. In 1970, I was hit by a car on Main Street and Tower. That ambulance that came once again didn't know how to do anything. They loaded me into the back of the ambulance and took me to Ely. Um, I was alone, I was five years old. I sat there thinking to myself, what's going on? I remember a lot of things about that day and the biggest thing I remember was nobody could help me. My dad at that point said, you know what? This is crazy, we're gonna fix it. So he and another person who worked at the school became the first EMTs in Tower. Um, they worked both full-time jobs. My dad worked at the mine, he worked at Reserve at the time, which is gone. Um, he would go to, go to work during the day, come home, and we had something called a plectron. It would go off, it would make all kinds of noise in the house, and he would go. Um, he was teaching people how to do CPR. He was, you know, volunteering everything. Well, eventually, volunteerism, we just can't continue with it. People don't have money to pay their bills, let alone, get, you know, leave their families and all all of that, so now we've become more of the paid on call that Mel talked about. Um, I don't want to see a day when somebody calls 911 and nobody comes. I want there to always be a local presence. And coming out as first responders, you're not gonna have the equipment needed. We do use ALS services with our BLS. Um, we have very good ALS partners and we have you know time where we work with them and we know when to call them and what to ask for when they come out the thing is if we continue funding EMS and treating EMS the way that we do we won't have it before too long mm -hmm. um, where I work BLS providers start IVs we do many things that metro area EMTs cannot do we need our, our ALS providers because when things get bad, when somebody's in crisis, they come in and they step in the rig and they help us. I'm asking today for you to look at this bill. Um, we need to have SF3886 funded. We need that help right now and then we need to work with our legislators to come up with a way to support EMS that is continuous and it's fair because White Lakes shouldn't have to support their whole area and Tower shouldn't have to support their whole area. You know, Tower's a low mid, you know, we don't have the money. So let's, you know, all work together and come up with a solution. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, next is Mayor uh, Setterberg and uh, Chief uh, uh, Jankula. Welcome to the um, <clears throat> um, committee, Mayor. Thank you. If you didn't identify yourself for the record. Um, my name's Dave Setterberg. I'm the mayor of Tower, Minnesota. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, just a little bit about the ambulances. We are volunteer ambulance service. We always have been. We used to make money when we didn't pay anybody anything when they went out on a call. Um, years later, and it wasn't all that long ago, we started paying just when they went out on a call. Um, now, especially with things changing, rules changing, EMSRB now is really enforcing that we have two people on call 24-7, seven days a week. Um, and we can't recoup the revenues. We, we pay our people now approximately 10 to $12 an hour to um, waiting to be engaged. And if they do go on a run, we spend a few more dollars. Uh, what happens is to our budget, we have now increased our labor costs approximately over $200,000 a year um, and not the revenues. Um, speaking of the runs, we normally do around 550, which is increasing uh, runs a year, 80%, which are Medicare and Medicaid, so over 400 runs a year. Um, our Medicare and Medicaid, to which we're a basic life support service, we get three, uh, $433 per run. We normally charge anybody else $1,200 a run. We are getting approximately, on an annual basis, we get shorted on our revenues approximately $300,000 a year for our city. Um, that's a big hit. Um, our city is a moderate to low income city. We have a population of about 430 people. Um, and we're being asked to make up that difference from Medicaid, Medicare, and all these other things. Um, we, with, um, we, we've looked into doing grants for moderate to um, low income. We've been denied, even though we're the service owner, we're solely responsible for the monies, we're denied because our service area has much wealthier areas in it, so therefore we don't qualify for grants to cover our service. Um, so when we take a look, we're not fond of necessarily raising taxes, and when we take a look at um, raising the taxes, according to the rules, and we're checking into this, is that we could only raise them on our 430 people in our city, not on our service area. Um, so we're hoping to see if we can look around that because everybody, the wealthier ones that donate. We, we actually have townships that are donating about $50,000 towards helping us buy ambulances. The City of Tower adds in another $50,000 out of our budget, which is actually 10% of our levy um, going right to the ambulance. Um, so just to, um, you know, and I want to thank our townships and everybody too in Boys Fort for doing the donations because they don't have to and some don't donate towards it. Um, I guess takeaways, we'll keep moving here. Um, we have a lot of good people doing a lot uh, difficult job for very little pay. Medicare and Medicaid do not pay for the service that they're receiving. And rural service providers can't afford to the cost of an ambulance service and we need your help. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to ask uh, the mayor of Hiving to uh, join his uh, fire chief up here, if you'd stand back. But we'll turn to the fire chief. If you would identify yourself, um, uh, Chief, um, uh, uh, for the record, we'll be pleased to have your testimony, and then we'll turn to the mayor. Madam Chair, committee members, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Eric Jankel, and I'm the fire chief for the City of Amy Fire Department. Um, I will let Mayor Hyduke, he's got a little bit more demographics and, and on the governance of our operation. To kind of caveat what our colleagues in Hoyt Lakes and, and Tower have said before, we are a career full-time ALS ambulance service. Um, in the 28 years that I've been there, we've gone up from a run volume of 1,500 calls to nearly 4,000. In that time frame, um, as we know that volunteerism has uh, dwindled and declined, regional call volumes have gone through the roof. Um, our service is called uh, quite a bit to help out some of our neighbors who are struggling with volunteerism, who are struggling with, with uh, the day-to-day -day operations and just don't have the, the fiscal means. 
So our, our ambulance service also ends up bearing the brunt of some of those operating uh, costs towards uh, assisting some of our communities just because we're one of two full-time ALS ambulance services in, in, a, in a vast geographical region of our, of, our, uh, of our area. And we are happy to assist our colleagues. We also, they, we also do receive uh, assistance from them from time to time. But as this number grows and we've had a significant increase in uh, our call volumes, whether it's transfer volumes or 911s, it, it, it is just the fee-for-service model based on the Medicare Medicaid premises is just not sustainable for us anymore. 80% across northeastern Minnesota is uh, roughly uh, our Medicare Medicaid patients. Um, we're at about 10% volume for uninsured patients, and we're at about 10% for private pay. And the fee-for-service just doesn't cut it any longer. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, if you'd identify yourself for, um, for the record, we're pleased to have your testimony. Yes, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Pete Hajduk, Mayor of Hibbing. Uh, Senator Hostile, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, Hibbing has an area of about 186 square miles, over 16,000 residents. But besides our city, our Ambulance Primary Service Area, or PSA, is over 600 square miles. Oh. Further, rural hospitals now do not staff all the specialties of special care, which means we transport most of our residents or most of our uh, patients almost two hours which is usually to Duluth, to the nearest specialist. You multiply that times two, that's a four hour run for most of our runs. As a mayor of a rural community, my fellow councilors and I work hard with city staff. We try and keep the cost of doing business in our city down as low as possible when funding our core services. Emergency medical services are definitely a core service that our Hibbing Fire Department provides to our residents and we are proud of the fine job that our EMS staff does. The cost to stand up this department, ensure they have the right equipment training, and all the essential resources to respond to an emergency call is a cost borne solely by the residents of Hibbing while serving an entire 600 square mile PSA. In 2023, we completed over 3,000 3, ambulance runs, of which as Chief had mentioned, 80%, 80% are not reimbursed at a full cost. The actual average cost that we're, we're entailing is $475 per run. Finally, we turned down calls for transfers and runs from mutual aid communities like Virginia when our five ambulance rigs are out on calls. When Hibbing residents are already subsidizing the department at $1.5 million annually. So we feel it's impossible to continue at this level or add to the department's capacity without your support. I'm here today to plead with you to please pass and consider the funding bill to give us short-term funding relief and while work continues a long-term solution. And I guess I ask everyone here, when you dial 911, you just think you're getting something, but nobody really thinks about where, who's paying for that ambulance that comes to you. You just dial 111, you expect it to be there. Uh, I can personally tell you, Chair, Rest, last year after testifying to you, I went home very sick. I had to be rushed, I was gonna be rushed to Duluth. I had to wait for an ambulance an hour and a half from Deer River to take me from the Hibbing Hospital to Duluth because all of our rigs were out on calls. So it is very personal to me and it really is an issue as everyone here has expressed today. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. And um, um, you have, apparently recovered. Yes, and, I have. And you look very happy. I'm glad to be down here again. Yes. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, next is uh, the uh, two mayors from uh, Virginia and Ely. We'll start with the mayor from Ely, ma'am. If you'd identify yourself for the record. Okay. Greetings. My name is Heidi Omerza, and I'm the mayor of Ely, Minnesota. Thank you, uh, Chair Rest, and the rest of the committee. Um, a little bit of history from Ely. Um, in 1988, the strict requirements set upon the ambulance service, a joint powers was formed with Ely, Winton, a neighboring uh, city, and two um, neighboring um, townships took over, and they've been in charge, <clears throat> excuse me, ever since. Our primary service area 
is 1,500 1, square miles. That is about the size of Rhode Island, the state of Rhode Island. It also includes the Boundary Waters Wilderness Area. Um, in that area is approximately 5,000 people, full-time residents. However, that changes quite a bit in the summertime, where we have many summer residents who own cabins, and also about 200,000 people who like to come visit our area. So this causes quite a problem for us when it comes to our ambulance service, um, because we don't quite have a handle on that, because it goes back down to the 5,000 people that actually pay for said service. This last year, um, our ambulance service subsidy quadrupled, quadrupled over the last four years. If we were to actually put that on our levy, which we did not, it would have been a 6% increase on our levy alone. We chose not to do that. That would have been 6% for every single entity that pays in. We chose not to do that. However, we are at a place right now where we simply do not know what to do. I liken it to the fact that we are on, we're in the river, we have a canoe, we've lost our paddles, and the rapids are ahead. We don't know what to do anymore. Do we pass this on to um, our, our citizens, who by the way, we are at um, our, our, um, our medium income household is 64.4% of the state medium. Is that who we pass it on to when our visitors who come are, is that what we do? We don't know. Um, do, uh, do, do, we, do we wait and help, hope you help us, which that's what we're hoping <laughs> for the, the quick fix? Um, the other piece to all this is a lot of our ambulance service, which by the way is round the clock full-time employees who come from as far away as Hibbing. Thank you Hibbing for letting us take some of your employees. Um, do, do we lower their wages? Do we put a wage freeze on them? We need all of our employees. It's bare bones there. Um, so we are continuing to look for answers and we, we are a community that does not ask for a lot of handouts because we're pretty proud that way. And we always look for out of the box solutions. But this is the one time where we are looking to you for our one time fix. Our local hospital is helping to look for answers for us. And we're hoping next year to come with more answers. But right now we're asking you for this one time fix. So thank you and uh, for listening. And yep. thank you, Senator Hofschild. Um, thank you, Mary. Thank you very much. And now the mayor of the city of Virginia, if you'd identify yourself. And uh, I will tell you, we have approximately 10 more minutes and we have eight or nine more testifiers. So if you could be extremely brief, that would be greatly appreciated by them. I'll go dance to my bullet points. Uh, good morning, uh, Senator Rest, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for letting us testify here today. It's a very important issue. First thing, we need help. We need, all, we all need help. Our rural ambulance needs help from the legislation from the federal government. So thank you, Senator Holchar, for sponsoring this bill. It's, uh, it's very important. So Virginia has a population of 8,432. I represent the, uh, the city of Virginia as the mayor. I'm also part of the Range Association of Municipalities and Schools. We're also a, a proud partner of the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities. And I'm also a chair, a board member of the uh, Range of Mental Health Board. I put that in because it affects our ambulance service as well. We have four, a full-time LS provider. We run six ambulance rigs. We have 38 fire EMS, dual role firefighter paramedics, single role paramedics, and full-time EMT EMTs. We serve an area of 640 square miles. Our annual, annual ambulance budget, just the ambulance budget alone is $3.8 million. We take 2,664 EMS runs in 2023, and that does not include the transfers or intercepts. 1,253 additional transfers, 1,667 Medicare runs, gross charges of $3.7 million, of which we only recovered 1.03, which is 28% return. We are losing 475, like Hibbing, and $500 per ambulance run on a regular basis. Our runs are anywhere from 50 to 100 miles on average, oftentimes a lot farther from patient, from call to patient, from patient to uh, hospital. So that's important. 
We had a loss in 2023 of $552,723.64. That does not include our capital equipment. We have equipment bond over a 10-year period that we pay off for our equipment. So we have covered this 640 square miles primarily all 100% on our budget. We get no reimbursements from any other committees for that. We supplement the ALS service with the BLS service and help these other ambulance services out. When they can't respond, we respond. We respond regardless whether they need us or not. So small cities and townships in this rural area are experiencing the same things we are. Personnel changes, volunteer paid on call service where they need to try to have that staffing level. This results in the response for medical care by Virginia EMS Ambulance Service, which we bear the entire burden. The money comes from our cash reserves over the last five years, and our cash reserves are dwindling. And this is no longer a sustainable model. So thank you for listening to us today. We thank the EMS task force moving forward in an effort to try to take on this very complicated task. And the last thing I want to say is in 2002, the Minnesota Department of Health put together a very, very comprehensive plan in 2002, published in December, a quiet crisis, Minnesota's rural ambulance service at risk. This is our, what we use as a guideline. Nothing was ever really accomplished with this 2002 study, but there's a lot of good things in there to help us move forward and keep our ambulance services, both rural, volunteer, and full-time ALS service viable and be able to provide the services moving forward. So thank you very much for the opportunity to um, testify. Thank you, sir. Thank you, both of you. Uh, next, we have Paul Peltier and Tony uh, Kalek, Deck, sorry, um, from the executive director from RAMS and the city administrator from the city of um, Rushford. If you would identify yourself, we'll start with uh, Mr. Peltier. Um, again, if you could keep your comments to summarize your comments to one minute, that would be um, greatly appreciated. Mr. Peltier. Thank you, Senator Rest and members of the committee. My name is Paul Peltier and I'm the Executive Director of the Range Association of Municipalities and Schools, or RAMS. RAMS is comprised of cities, townships, and school districts in the Taconite Assistance Area. We have a 13,000 13, square mile region with 155,000 residents. Many of our PSAs are represented here today. As an organization, RAMS has been advocating for the needs of the TAA, the Iron Range, and the Northland for over 85 years. I'm here to communicate our board's and my personal full support of Senate File 3886, authored by Senator Housechild. But first, let me put a fine point on this. We have a lot of success stories in Greater Minnesota, and they are exactly what's at risk right now. And it doesn't just affect our locals, it affects everybody across the state. Here's why. Just last week, a man from Faribault, Minnesota reportedly traveled around 270 miles to northern St. Louis County to visit their family cabin and do some ATV riding. While the driver was navigating a steep ditch, the ATV began to slide downhill and it eventually flipped over, landing on the driver. The family called 911 and first responders rendered aid before the driver was taken to a Duluth hospital. How did this patient get from county ditch to the hospital doorstep? Greenwood, Tower, Virginia Ambulance all responded before the driver was airlifted by North Memorial Air Medical Helicopter coming from Eveleth, Virginia. Greenwood was local, Tower was 11 miles away, and Virginia Ambulance drove 30 miles to render aid. The flight from the accident site to the Duluth Hospital was around 90 miles. Like I said, a success story. But what happens to the success story when the providers disappear? Our rural ambulance services are at a financial and staffing breaking point. If one service folds, the care just gets worse. There is no one available, no one available to pick up the slack and the service area. We are continuing to face a widening rural disparity. The quality of your school, broadband access, and in this case, life-saving medical treatment should not be determined by your zip code. No matter where you live, work, or indeed play, this bill is an opportunity to show that everyone everywhere matters. Thank you, Madam Chair. Trader for the city of Rushford. Uh, Madam Chair, my name Identify yourself. We have two more testifiers. Yes. So Madam, please Madam, keep that in mind. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Madam Chair, my name is Tony Cloddick. I'm the city administrator from And Rushford. I need you to speak louder. Okay. Madam Chair, my name is Tony Cloddick. I'm the city administrator from Rushford, Minnesota. I will be brief uh, to respect everybody <laughs> else's time. Uh, on February 12th, uh, the city of Rushford Council approved our first paid on call system to recruit and retain uh, uh, our uh, uh, volunteer staff. 
Uh, and that's primarily what we have in Rushford, Minnesota, is a volunteer staff. Uh, we find it very difficult to retain uh, our volunteer staff, and this is the first time that we've ever done that. Uh, we've increased our, our base rates, we increased our mileage charges, we increased our, our per capita fees, and we have various scenarios going on around us. Uh, we have a community uh, very close to us that may be discontinuing their service which means our volunteer folks, who we have a very hard time recruiting and retaining, may have to pick up additional services. If that scenario and other scenarios unfold, without additional support, we're going to have repeating meetings like this, and eventually growing concerns about workforce costs and then response time fears will occur. Senate file 3886 would provide some much needed relief please pass it, and then let's continue our work looking for ongoing solution, because we wouldn't ask you to do anything we aren't already doing. Thank you for your time and consideration. Uh, thank you very much. Our final testifiers are um, <coughs> Mr. Lee from North Memorial um, and Mr. Juntinen um, from, the Minneapolis, from the Minnesota Ambulance Association, two other people who are on our list are Eric Simonson and Cap O'Rourke. We would uh, invite your written testimony to be part of the uh, record. And then um, following your testimony, we have a question from our comment from Senator Weber, and then that will complete our hearing for today, um, Senator Housechild. Mr. Lee. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Kevin Lee. I'm the Emergency Services Relationship Specialist for North Memorial. As I'm sure you know, North Memorial Healthcare is a health system that has hospitals both in Robbinsdale and Maple Grove. We also have more than 20 clinic locations and we have an expansive statewide EMS system consisting of both ground and air ambulance resources. EMS has been my life's work. I started working in EMS in 1984 and I've been working in EMS uh, full time ever since. So I have over 40 years of experience, and uh, most of that has been in outstate Minnesota. My last 25 years have been spent with North Ambulance in the Brainerd region. I was the district chief there for 15 years. So I am acutely aware of the struggles that uh, outstate ambulance providers face in Minnesota. In addition to our, uh, excuse me, in addition to our metro operations, we cover several small communities in the outstate. And I'll run through that list. I know it's a little long, but I'll get through it as soon as I can. But I think it's Im important for people to understand all of the small communities that North Memorial serves in the state of Minnesota. These include Brainerd, Cross Lake, Pine River, Aiken, Longville, Walker, Park Rapids, Alexandria, Princeton, Zimmerman, Malacca, Marshall, New Prague, Faribault, and Wasika. Over the years, we have seen a growing trend of smaller outstate ambulance services transitioning their ownership to larger providers like North Memorial. Because the private and municipal operators were no longer able to sustain their operations due to financial problems and or staffing problems. Financial challenges have been largely driven by Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement rates, rates, excuse me, which as you know, are our primary source of income. We are also facing increased staffing costs because we need to pay people to be on duty in the station 24 hours a day, seven days a week. As some of the other testifiers have mentioned, we, we can no longer rely on volunteerism or excuse me, I should say we can no longer rely on volunteers or on-call uh, personnel to staff our ambulances. With the current financial pressures, we and other outstate providers are losing hundreds of thousands of dollars every year. Coupled with financial sustainability challenges, outstate providers are also struggling with the need for adequate staffing and in some areas, low volumes. EMS and subordinate taxing districts can help in some areas, 
but of course not all taxing districts have the same population density or wealth. What may work in one part of the state may not work in a different part of the state. Short and long-term financial aid from the state is necessary to support operations in, the, in their current hardship situations and for the sustainability of the industry. Minnesotans expect a rapid response when they have a medical emergency regardless of the, where they are located. Having a reliable EMS system in our state needs to be a priority. I'm happy to any, excuse me, happy to answer any questions. yourself for the record. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I, will, of the I will mention that um, North Memorial is my hospital. Mm -hmm. And I, <laughs> I have uh, received, I've been a recipient of your ambulance service, and I can't tell you how much it meant to me personally. Um, uh, as a gentleman before indicated, um, he used an ambulance service up in his, in his, um, uh, in his uh, area. It was not life-saving, but it was extremely um, important uh, that they were there and that they um, uh, transported me um, in record time, I might say. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate sure. that. So if you'd identify yourself uh, for the record, um, <clears throat> our last testifier is the incoming president of the Minnesota Ambulance Association. A, a fitting close to this, ter this testimony, I might add. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you again, members of the committee. Uh, I'll try to make this the quick version. So as mentioned, my name is Michael Johnson, and I am the incoming president for the Minnesota Ambulance Association. Uh, we want to express strong support for House File 3886, uh, looking for one-time funding. Uh, today, we know that people are being served throughout the state of Minnesota, but we are facing critical challenges with workforce shortages and, and insufficient funding. Uh, this has resulted in EMS personnel leaving the profession in droves. Um, and this ultimately results in a threat to the health and safety of our, of our communities. The proposed funding can be used for things such as recruiting and retaining EMS personnel, upgrading equipment, technology, and supporting our rural EMS services that are probably at the highest risk um, of, of closure and stuff at this point. Investing in our EMS system is about saving lives. Um, and supporting these, the bills that have been proposed uh, sends a clear message that we value the critical work of our EMS personnel. So I urge you to continue to move forward with uh, Senate File 3886, and I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you uh, very much. Um, we have two comments from members, Senator Housechild, Senator Weber, and then Senator, Senator Dibble, and then we'll allow you a final comment. I guess in Senator Nelson. Um, we will start with Senator Weber and go down the line. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, certainly, I'm supportive of the bill. My question deals with the fact that this is a one-time distribution, but a million dollars is being allocated for administrative costs to the agency, uh, to the Department of Revenue, with an undesignated portion of that to go to the Emergency Medical Service Regulatory Board. To me, that seems excessive, and I'd like some explanation on that. Um, uh, Senator Weber, I mentioned in our com in the comments when Senator Housechild was explaining the bill that that you know we're laying it over. It's going to come back up off the table, okay. and that is going to be a particular concern about whether um, that's the the right um, the right number. And we're getting a we'll get a, a fiscal note and more information from the Department of um, of Revenue in particular. But thank you for bringing thank that you. up. It is already an issue before us. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just thought I would uh, mention to uh, Senator Hauschild and everyone gathered around this issue that um, last year we um, took a substantial step forward in reinvigorating the Towards Zero Deaths Initiative that we have in this state, um, as well as uh, reestablishing the Minnesota Council on Traffic Safety, which is an entity that has about 30 some people sitting at it. Um, across the board gathered around driving down crashes, but also um, uh, you know, the resulting injury and deaths that result from crashes. And it 
uh, relies on kind of the four E's, which of course are education, enforcement, engineering, and emergency services. Mm -hmm. um, so I would invite you to their next meeting, which is before session concludes, um, to gain access to a lot of folks who we could probably energize around this issue um, and also establish you know, a long-term plan, not just the one-time shot um, you know, to um, get ourselves moving in the right direction because uh, we're moving in the wrong direction on this subject in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Oh. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for the good discussions. Clearly, uh, I support this. Uh, EMS is on life support quite frankly, and we are seeing that in our rural communities, especially I have communities that no longer have EMS service. It's, 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 it's frightening, it should not be happening today. But I would just say two things very briefly. EMS seems to be a bit like a canary in the coal mine when it comes to government paid health care. I mean, what, what I'm reading, what I'm seeing, and what I'm hearing at home is one of the biggest issues is that government paid health care, Medicare, Medicaid does not pay the freight. They don't pay the cost of the service. And what we see when they don't pay the cost of the service is the service is not what we expect and what we want for our constituents. So that, that is concerning. And the one thing I would say going forward, I hope the, com the, uh, the commission continues to meet because while this is one-time aid, it does nothing to solve the ongoing problem of reimbursement, low reimbursement from government. And somehow we have to look at how we can better, uh, we don't have a magic wand uh, telling the federal government what to do, but we have to be very cognizant. We need to find some better solutions. So thank you for the start and for the good support today. Senator Halstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I won't take any more time. I think we heard a, a plethora of, of examples and, and why this is really a crisis facing uh, the entire state. And my hope is that we are able to do something this session to, to help uh, these providers in the short term. And to Senator Nelson's point, we are, like I said, with the task force and many others involved, looking at those mid to long term solutions that will help us create a sustainable path for this critical service we need. Yes, thank you, Senator Hellstrell. None of us thinks that the money that would be appropriated for this emergency aid for emergency services is um, uh, tackles the long-term pr problem, but that doesn't mean we should wait. That does not mean we should wait because we don't have a long-term solution um, in, in front of us. So that's, that's the thrust of, of Senator Hellstrell's bill. Thank you very much. Thank you for those of you that have come to uh, testify and, um, and members of the, uh, of the audience. Um, otherwise, we uh, really appreciate your patience today. No further business before the Senate Tax Committee. We stand adjourned. Thanks, everyone.